In January, the State Department of Health announced its plans to expand where it engages in wastewater surveillance and increase the number of diseases it's testing for in an effort to improve the public health in the Empire State. For more on this initiative, we've got two guests, and we're joined on the Capitol Press Room by Dr. Kirsten St. George, Chief of Viral Disease and Director of Virology at the Wadsworth Center. Welcome to the show, Doctor. Thank you very much, David. Nice to be with you. And we also have with us Dan Lang, Deputy Director of the Center for Environmental Health at the State Health Department. Welcome to the show, Dan. Thank you very much. Great to be here. So for most New Yorkers, I don't think the idea or concept of wastewater as a means of detecting the existence or prevalence of a disease was on their radar uh, until it was used to detect uh, COVID-19. But the concept predates the pandemic. So prior to 2020, how, if at all, was wastewater surveillance utilized uh, in New York? The real beginning of, of wastewater surveillance for you know respiratory viruses really did begin with SARS-CoV-2 and COVID here in New York. Uh, prior to that, um, there has been a lot of research being done in other aspects of science uh, regarding illicit uh, materials as well as other uh, bacterial diseases, but nothing on the scale that we have now, um, now that COVID-19 has hit us. And uh, we have now this um, remarkable uh, network now in all 62 counties of the state. So it really was uh, COVID that that brought us into the current um, network. And generally speaking, how does the surveillance and testing of wastewater actually work right now? Do you send a guy with a bucket over to a treatment facility and then have him drive that bucket over to, say, the Wadsworth lab? The uh, the wastewater treatment plant has operators uh, that collect samples on, a, on usually a daily basis because they, they monitor the chemistry of the influent of the wastewater so that they can treat it and put it out, you know, into the rivers and lakes as, it, you know, meeting all environmental standards. So, you know, this is a you know, shout out to all of our wastewater treatment plant operator partners across the state because they do this on a voluntary basis. They collect those samples. We provide them with the bottles and the coolers that they put that those samples in and they ship them free of charge to our, our laboratories. And we have a network of laboratories across the state, not just at Wadsworth, Center, but our Wadsworth Center does do some of the analysis, uh, especially for our new expansion that we're adding on to the program for uh, SARS-CoV-2 sequencing, as well as our pilots on other pathogens that we can detect in wastewater. Well, yeah, Kirsten, what goes into actually analyzing these samples, say, at the Wadsworth labs? And how long does it take or how many people are involved in examining uh, samples you might get? So there are several steps to the process, David. We receive uh, the samples actually after the initial process has been done by the first round of receiving labs. They do the processing and extract the genetic material out of those samples. That's quite a specialized process in and of itself. And they do some of the initial testing. They do the actual detection testing for SARS-CoV-2 at other labs. And we receive the samples that are already designated and de- detected for uh, as positive for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and then the, those positive samples are distributed actually among five laboratories around the state, including Wadsworth, to perform sequence analysis of the SARS-CoV-2 viruses in them to determine which variants and lineages of the virus are in the samples. And that enables us to, to track the circulating strains and lineages of the virus around the state, which has become increasingly difficult uh, in recent months as home testing and point of care testing and so on has increased in popularity. And so our access to those samples has decreased. We've always managed to obtain samples fairly readily from hospitalized patients, but the virus that's circulating in the general community and among patients who are not so sick 
um, they have become increasingly difficult to access for sequence analysis. And so our ability to monitor those more generally circulating strains has become a little more difficult. And so we have become increasingly relying on wastewater samples to be able to analyze those um, generally circulating strains. And then in addition to that, we receive additional samples from the processing labs for these uh, additional pathogens, as, as Dan mentioned. And we have several teams uh, at Wadsworth and at other laboratory sites who are participating in this expanded program to test for uh, influenza and monitor influenza around the state, um, in addition to the human surveillance programs that we have running to see if we can see any, um, gain any additional insight into the circulation patterns for flu. Also RSV, we saw a tremendous increase. It was a particularly severe RSV, that's respiratory syncytial virus, which is particularly severe in young children, but can also affect older adults. As I said, particularly severe this, uh, this particular season. That has also been added as a pilot program. We're also looking at hepatitis A, which causes sporadic outbreaks in various sectors of the community at, um, at different times and really looking to see where it goes when it's not causing outbreaks. It sort of disappears and reappears a little bit mysteriously and we'd like to know where it is if we can when it, when it disappears and so see if we can detect it before a little in advance of outbreaks so that we can get in and implement some mitigation practices before it uh, takes off on those outbreaks. Uh, similarly for norovirus, which is a very common cause of gastroenteritis and uh, notorious for causing uh, gastroenteritis outbreaks on cruise ships, but also in other situations uh, around the community. And um, likewise, we'd like to know sort of where it goes and what it does in between the outbreaks, uh, because it's uh, a little bit uh, unsure of how that um, circulation mechanism happens outside of the outbreaks. So we'd like to be able to monitor that as well through wastewater to see where it is. Um, and um, also looking at antimicrobial resistance, a huge problem in healthcare with increasing uh, resistance patterns in the bacterial uh, pathogens. And that is another uh, significant pilot program that we have being operated out, out of our bacterial laboratory here at Wadsworth. So there are a number of teams, uh, as I mentioned, not, not just at Wadsworth, but at a, a number of participating laboratories in this expanded program around New York State to look at uh, all of these different pathogens. Uh, that's just in the current pilot program. And then we have even more after that in a further expansion to the program planned for next year. Well, for listeners just joining us, you're listening to the Capitol Press Room, and we're talking about an expansion of the state's wastewater surveillance program. And our guests are Dr. Kirsten St. George of the Wadsworth Center and Dan Lang of the State Department of Health. And I'm curious what goes into this expanded capacity, both of the participating plants as well as the ability to uh, test for additional pathogens, like you mentioned, flu, RSV, hepatitis A, uh, et cetera. So what do you actually have to do to, to make this happen, both on the site and testing uh, capacity issues? There are 600 treatment plants that treat sewage throughout the state of New York. Many of those treatment plants are small. So we have about 140 treatment plants already participating in the program. We plan to expand to as many as 215 or more. And the reason for that is that we want to not only get as many uh, New Yorkers uh, represented by the information that we get from, from wastewater surveillance, but also um, to expand geographically. So in, in some of our counties, you know, there may be a large, uh, one large city, but many small towns. And so, you know, to get a representative look at either COVID or other diseases, uh, it may not be uh, appropriate to have only one uh, represent the entire county, right? So we want to have multiple treatment plants sampling uh, throughout all of our counties. And that's why we've uh, embarked upon this expansion program. And what that really means is that as you get to smaller treatment plants, they may not necessarily have the equipment and the personnel and, and other, uh, other aspects of collecting these samples. So that's really where a lot of our effort will, will go into expanding this geographically, is really helping out those wastewater treatment plant operators and, and getting them the materials that they need uh, if they're willing and, and able to collect those samples. 
we've had a, an amazing response from our wastewater treatment plant operators. They truly are you know, part of the, the public health workforce. Uh, they ensure that wastewater that comes out of your, your toilet and into your sewers uh, does not enter back into our water and our drinking water that could cause disease. So they're already champions and, and warriors in this fight. And we were glad that they have, um, you know, voluntarily, you know, came on to this program. We provided a training for them that, that, that allows them to get uh, continuing education credits as part of their operator license uh, around what, what it is to be part of the wastewater uh, based epidemiology program here in, in New York state. Uh, so yeah, that's really how it, how it starts. We work with our local health departments to figure out which treatment plants are best, you know, best represent their, their county populations. And we work with both them and the uh, towns and municipalities to get them on board. We have funding as announced from CDC as well as the state. And so we're using that funding to embark upon this geographic expansion. Each individual pathogen, you know, we have a series of discussions and meetings about the pros and cons of whether or not to introduce it for the next round of pilots. And then again, for each individual pathogen, we talk about which areas for that pilot program, which geographical geographical areas uh, would be most appropriate to trial because we do not cover the entire state for the pilot program. We just go into selected areas and which are the most logical areas to do that for for the pilot for that pathogen. And for each pathogen, it's slightly different. Um, and then there's a, a process for developing the method and checking the method specifically for wastewater because it's invariably a, a, a target pathogen for which we already have tests available in the, in the lab for human clinical specimens. But then we have to to test that method on wastewater and the parameters are very different uh, and there's a there's a process to go through to actually validate the method on on wastewater specimens and we have found that it, do, it doesn't always translate well when we have to actually develop a new method and completely revalidate a whole new method for that target we've had to do that just recently for hepatitis a uh, and check all of the parameters and make sure it's working to uh, optimal detection levels and then we can actually implement it and start testing it on the pilot samples so it's actually quite a a, a uh, an involved process to even get a pilot program underway for every one of those um, pathogens on the new pilot list. So what are the policy outcomes that could arise from having expanded capacity to test for uh, additional pathogens and testing at additional sites? So we're hopeful that, you know, we will be comparing the surveillance data that we get from wastewater with the surveillance data that we get from human surveillance programs, uh, the, the, the surveillance data that we get from testing human surveillance samples, as well as clinical disease samples from outbreaks. And we're comparing this data and meeting with our state epidemiologists to see how much additional information can be gleaned from this for intervention guidelines and policies and so on to really help just, not just monitor the disease but mitigate the disease spread uh, for improving the health care of the people of New York and mitigate and control the disease spread in an improved manner with this additional information. If we can, can see where and how it's spreading with this additional information, we have a much better data and information source to be able to control them. So what does the future of surveillance of wastewater look like? Is it just more sites and expanding the list of pathogens, or could it take other shapes or have other ramifications depending on, say, the way technology might evolve? What we're really trying to do is get a network in place so that this is a routine sampling and testing program. And so it, it, it's not necessarily something that we need to react to at, at all times, but it's always there. It's always working in the background. And when there is a either an emerging pathogen or a strain of, of a variant that is concerning, you will already have this, uh, this network in place and will already have plans in place to be able to respond to it with equipment and training for the people you know in the field. The other aspect that I would talk a little bit about is, you know, a lot of 
the logistics of wastewater surveillance now have been built over the COVID pandemic. And so we're sampling in the, in the wastewater stream. We're shipping those samples to laboratories. We're then taking extracts and we're shipping those extracts to other laboratories. And so there's a, there's a, there's a lot of room in the future for being able to cut down on the time that it takes to both collect and send and test samples. I see the future as being something that, you know, has a lot more of this happening on a routine basis that can happen more locally, you know, so that information can uh, be, be gained quicker with, you know, backstops on quality, as, as Kirsten points out, which is why our Wadsworth Center is such a key partner on this program to be able to get those methods tested and verified so that what you're actually testing, um, you know, you can be confident in, in, the, in the result. We found with, uh, for example, with COVID that we can detect in wastewater one and sometimes even two weeks ahead uh, of what shows up with clinical human sample monitoring, a rise in circulating virus, a rise in ahead of uh, disease incidents. So it can be a really tremendous early warning indicator. The other advantage with the wastewater testing system that has been set up is that we actually have retrospectively stored samples. And so when something emerges, we can go back into our archive and pull samples from there and test them and say, you know, where did this come from? Was it there before that, that, you know, we, we didn't know about because we weren't testing and, and got, say, look to see how far back it was actually circulating before the disease sort of presented itself clinically in the, the population. And, and these are tremendous advantages for epidemiological intervention and disease tracking. Could wastewater surveillance ever be used to like judge or monitor the general health of a local community, like if they had healthy diets, or is that beyond the capacity of something we could expect from wastewater surveillance in the future? Yeah, I, I think there are some some efforts at looking at certain like environmental biomarkers, right? So there may be things in uh, you know people who may be exposed to different environmental conditions. Uh, may have biomarkers where, you know, they could, uh, and this could be related to stress, right? It could be from some kind of environmental stress. It may end up being possible to detect these in wastewater. And so those are the kinds of things I think the next generation of wastewater surveillance will be looking at. Well, we've been speaking with Dr. Kirsten St. George, Chief of Viral Diseases and Director of Virology at the Wadsworth Center. Thank you for joining us, Doctor. Thank you, David. It's been a pleasure. And we've also been talking with Dan Lang, Deputy Director of the Center for Environmental Health in the State Health Department. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, David. It's been great being here. Support for the Capitol Press Room provided by the New York State AFL-CIO, a federation of 3,000 unions fighting for working people by keeping New York State union strong. Visit unionstrongny.org for more information. Join us again for Capitol Press Room, a production of WCNY Connected, Syracuse.